Okay, there we go. So, good morning, everyone. Today is uh, is the lecture day for problems or for sections one, eight, nine, and ten. Um, if you noticed on Monday, I did post the lectures uh, for those sections, and uh, they're up on YouTube now in the playlist. Um, they were a bit longer, just because these sections are a bit more um, a bit you know, a bit more advanced than the previous ones. I would say we're starting in a, starting to get into uh, some more complicated material and I did quite a few more examples I think than I've done in previous ones so sorry for the how for the length of those videos but uh, I think it was maybe helpful okay now we're at 14 this is great um, yeah so as I explained earlier I'm gonna be writing on a whiteboard today and uh, it's because my wife took the kids for a couple days out to see the grandparents in Syracuse and well she took the iPads with her um, you've probably noticed before that I my, the iPad I use has that blue protective uh, <laughs> case on it. So, um, right, so I, I don't have any any uh, technology except for just my webcam today. Um, so this will have to this will have to do. Um, if you can't read anything, if the video quality is not good enough for something like that, then just let me know and and I'll try and write a little larger. Um, also, if I write off the screen, you'll just maybe ask me to push it up a little bit or something. I've got a line here that kind of directs me, but I might miss that at some point. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So we are working on section 1.8 first, and we'll just get into a bunch of problems. Do you have any questions about homework problems or things like that? If you do, go ahead and throw them in the chat, and uh, I'll see that, and then I can look them up on WebAssign and we can go through those too. Um, but until then, I will just start working through section 1.8 and some problems of my choosing. Again, if you have your own problems you'd like to ask from the text or from WebAssign, or if you just want to type it into the chat, I will go through those as well. Alright, so section 1.8 was on inequalities, and the first kind of, uh, first kind of inequality that I'm going to just give you is just a list of things. So here's just a list of numbers. So that's just a set of numbers. Negative 5, negative 1, 0, 2 thirds, 5 sixths, 3, uh, and 5. And my question is, which of these numbers satisfy and this is question 7 now negative 2 plus 3x is greater than or equal to 1 third so as I explained in the in the lecture video for Monday an inequality like this this is a, a not an equation. It's an inequality because we've got this greater than or equal to sign here. What it's describing is a set of numbers, a set of numbers that make this inequality true. So when I give you a list of numbers like this and I ask which of these numbers satisfies this inequality, you're just trying to pick those numbers out of the list that make this a true statement. Now there's two ways to go about this. There's the brute force method, where you just check every number. And that will work. So there's brute force, where you check every number. That is, take negative 5, plug it in here, you get negative 2 plus negative 15, that's a negative number, so it's not bigger than one-third. You just go down the list, okay? But there's another method, which is where you solve the inequality first. And check the list instead. And this is the method that I'm going to suggest that we, we do and get, get good at. 
Um, and so I'll do that for you here. Because once you solve this inequality, it doesn't matter what numbers are in this list, it'll be quite simple to just look at the list and say these ones work, those ones don't. So how do you solve inequalities? Well, from the last time, uh, from Monday's lecture, we're going to treat this just like an equality where we add and subtract things from both sides, and that doesn't change anything here. We're going to multiply and divide by things on both sides, and sometimes that changes things here, uh, but I'll get to that when I get to that, and it won't be in this problem. So here we go. So the first thing I'll do is I'm just going to add 2 to both sides. I'm going to try and isolate this x on one side, just like with equalities. So that gives us the equivalent expression that 3x is bigger than or equal to 2 plus a third. 2 is 6 thirds, so this is now 7 thirds. And now I'm going to divide both sides by this 3. And because this is a positive number that I'm dividing by, this remains the same. If this were negative, we'd have to flip it around. So it would turn into this if this were a negative, but it is not a negative. Okay, So it's, it's not this problem, not yet. So this brings us to this. x is bigger than or equal to 7 thirds divided by 3, which is 7 ninths. So this is, this is the set of solutions, right? This is all solutions right there. That's every number. On a number line, right, here's 7 ninths. We would put a circle there, close it, because we've got a greater than or equal to, and then we would shade everything above it. This tells us that any number bigger than 7 ninths satisfies it. So now we just go back up to the list. And which of these are bigger than that? Not negative 5, it's negative. Not negative 1, it's negative. 0 is not bigger than that. 2 thirds. Not quite, right? That's 6 ninths, so not that one. 5 sixths is, I believe, bigger than 7 ninths. Okay, we'd have to, we could get a common denominator here of 6 times 9, which is 54. So 7 ninths is 42 out of 54, and 5 sixths is uh, 45 out of 54. And so then we see that 5 sixths is just 3 54ths bigger, just a little bit bigger. So that works. 1 is definitely bigger than a fraction, uh, 7 ninths. Root 5 is bigger than 1. 3 is bigger than 1. 5 is bigger than 1, so those all work. So this is the method that I would suggest for solving these linear, linear inequalities. Um, and this is exactly what you would do in, in, you know, without a list. If I asked you to just solve it, you would look for this, and you would graph it perhaps, or you would write it in interval notation. But when you're given a list and you're asked to check, you could do two things. If it's a short list, check everything else. Like just check it. <laughs> if it's a long list like this. I would solve it first and then go through the list quickly. Questions on this? All righty. So let me give you one here. And I'll ask you to try it. So this is number 8. It's the same list. And the question is, what numbers from that list satisfy this inequality? And I'll let you try it. So I'll give you a few minutes. I'll start a timer over here. Well, Siri will start a timer. But I'll start a timer over here. And uh, let's see what you can do. Okay. Hey Siri, set a timer for two minutes. Okay, two minutes and counting. 
All right, she'll tell you when when you should be done. Got about 20 seconds left to try and work through this one. All right, that's the timer. So, what did some of you get? You can either throw it in the chat or you can say it out loud. Either way works. I got 1 over 7 is greater than or equal to x. Okay, so this they solved and they got this. Okay, does anyone disagree? They don't condemn you, so neither do I. <laughs> this is right. Any number smaller than one seventh or equal to one seventh. On a number line, right, we have this number one seventh somewhere. We can include one seventh because of the equality here. And we're saying one seventh is greater than or equal to x. In other words, x is less than or equal to one seventh. So anything less than or equal to one seventh works. So we go through our list, right? Now that's negative. That's definitely less than zero. Is definitely less than that. And then we get into all these numbers, right? And this is a sorted list, so it's easy. But none of these work because they're all bigger than one seventh. Okay. Yeah. So this this checking of the list is super fast once you've done this. And this really is not too difficult either, right? one step for for adding over, one step for dividing, and you've got your solution. So in two steps, you've got it. If you go through and you check everything, that's a lot of steps. So the brute force method is definitely slower, definitely slower, but in a pinch, when you have a big brain fart, this totally, that totally would work. Questions about that? I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned it like a couple of minutes ago, but in what cases do you have to flip the sign? Here we go. I'll just change the numbers here a little bit. So in this case, we would solve this uh, subtracting 2x over. And then we would divide by this negative 7, right? So if we, if we think about this for just a second without doing that, Think of our number line here. We want to look for all the numbers x, which when you multiply by negative 7, are less than or equal to 1. Right? So what we need to be looking for here is, you know, clearly there's, there's a 1 7th floating around here. 
if we keep it positive one seventh, then we guarantee that this is that, that this is a negative number, right? Because we have a negative seven times that, which gives us a negative one. So one seventh has us here at negative one, which which works. If we go over to zero, we still get something that works. If we go to negative one seventh, right? So here we are on the the number line now, looking for solutions. Uh, zero worked. One seventh definitely worked. Oh, I was doing this the other way. If we're so one seventh, we checked that gave us a negative product, which is obviously less than a positive. We check zero, right? And and that's giving us zero. Negative one seventh is sort of where we start to encounter problems as we look for solutions this way because this gives us one on the right side. One equals one, so that works. But if we go a little bit further, like negative one, suddenly this is a positive seven and it doesn't work, right? So this doesn't work. And, and in fact, nothing over here would work. everything over here would work. There's this split right here. So now let's look at <clears throat> let's look at uh, what what we're saying here is any number bigger than or equal to negative one seventh. That would work. That's what we're looking at here. If we divide both sides by this negative seven I said earlier that that uh, inequality needs to change, and this is exactly why. Uh, let me we've got a one, we've got a oops, we've got a one, negative one seventh. We've we've divided by negative seven, so we get negative one seventh, and we've got this x. If we kept it in the original direction, which is wrong. What that is saying is that any number less than or equal to negative one seventh, so that's over here. And that's exactly the set of numbers we, we detected as false numbers, right? Numbers that do not satisfy this. Negative signs flip this because they flip the sign of things. So when you plug something positive in, it becomes negative, right? So very, very simple example would be would be this, right? Um, let's take a true statement. Negative one is definitely less than 10. We agree? Like this is definitely true. So now let's multiply both sides by a negative or divide both sides by a negative. And I'm gonna pick the easiest one. It's just negative one. So times negative one. So this is our this is our division by a negative number or a multiplication by a negative number. Is this still true? The new result is positive one, negative ten. That's not true anymore. What is true every time is if you flip the direction. And that's just because negatives change the direction of the real number line. They make the positive side the negative side, and they take the negative side and they make it the positive side. So that multiplication and division reorients the real number line, and this sign describes which direction you're going in, on the real number line, right? You're looking for numbers bigger, so that means to the right, or you're looking at numbers smaller, which means to the left. If you switch right and left, you need to switch the directions. Yes, exactly, yes. You, whenever there's a negative, whenever you multiply or divide by a negative, you switch the direction of the sign. The, the inequality sign. So I'll write that down.
in any inequality. A less than or equal to B. This could be anything. It could be greater than, it could be greater than or equal to, it could be what I have here, less than or equal to, or it could be just less than. So you could have any one of those. Right, any one of the four there. But I'll just write it as this. In any inequality, A less than or equal to B, negative A is greater than or equal to negative B. What that means is multiplying or dividing by negative numbers flips the inequality sign the inequality sign's direction. Okay? Great question. Yes. In any inequality, A less than or equal to B, if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, you have to change the direction of this, the inequality sign. And again, that's because we're flipping, you know, we're, we're taking positive numbers, multiplying them by negative makes them negative numbers. So we're changing the direction of the real number line. The positives are no longer on the right, they're actually on the left. And the negatives are no longer on the left, they're on the right. Okay, great question. Let's look at <clears throat> something a little more complicated now. So we'll look at maybe this one. This is 47. And in 47, you're asked to solve the inequality. There's no list. You're just solved to, asked to solve it, which means you're asked to find all solutions. And the inequality given in 47 is x squared is greater than 3 times x plus 6. x squared is greater than 3 times x plus 6. So the first thing to notice is that this is nonlinear. Right? This power here of 2 means we're working with a quadratic, a polynomial of degree 2. Okay, we call them parabolas, we call them quadratics, but it's a polynomial of degree 2. And in the video on Monday, I suggested a way to solve things like this. And I'll just briefly outline it here is bring everything, everything to one side. This is different than solving linear inequalities. With linear inequalities, you're trying to isolate the x, right? Get all the, con the constants on one side and all the x terms on the other side. This is different. So everything goes to one side. So I'm going to illustrate that here. x squared greater than 3x plus 6. So I'm going to just multiply through real quick. And then I'm going to bring everything to the left side. Is that okay? So subtract over the 3x subtract over the 18, and now this is greater than 0, right? There's nothing left on that side, so just a 0. Okay, now that we've got everything on one side, the second task is to try and factor. This is going to be like, what do they call this? A recurring thing, a motif. Right? A factor. You just got a factor. Which means you're looking for the binomials that multiply to give you this x squared minus 3x minus 18. So you're going to try and factor this. 
When I look at that, I, I think well, x squared is x times x. 18, I can write several different ways. 1 times 18, 2 times 9, 3 times 6, and that's the end of my list. One of them has to be negative because it's a negative 18. I don't know which yet, but when I look at the middle term, I see it's negative 3x, and that, and that tells me that the, the pairing we're going to use is this, because the difference of these is 3. 6 minus 3 is 3, so if I change the order, 3 minus 6, that means I'm giving the 6 the negative, 3 minus 6 is negative 3. So this, this gives me the factorization right away. So x squared minus 3x minus 18 factors as x minus 6 times x minus plus, sorry, 3. So now we've got a new inequality that looks very similar to the old one. step then is to recognize that solutions merely depend on the sign of each factor. Okay, the sign. I literally mean plus or minus. Okay, so this this factor, you know, if we, we plug in an x, if we plug in an x bigger than 6, it's positive. If we plug in an x less than 6, it's negative. For this one, if we plug in a number bigger than negative 3, we're going to have a positive number. If we plug in a number less than negative 3, we're going to have a negative number. And the reason I'm saying this is because we're looking for products that are bigger than zero, right? This number times this number is bigger than zero, meaning we're looking for products that are positive. So we need to find all the x's such that we have either a positive times a positive or a negative times a negative, right? We have to have a positive number times a positive number to get a positive number, or we need to have a negative number times a negative number to get a positive. So I gave a nice way to do that, to sort of organize that in the, uh, in the lecture on Monday, and that's with a table of factors and intervals. So the first thing that I said in that movie is you got to find the zeros of the factors, which is, is simple here. We've got a zero of 6, and we've got a zero of negative 3. And that's going to divide up the real number line. So here's negative 3, here's 6. I see that there's 1 two, three intervals here. The interval from negative infinity to negative three. The interval from negative three to six. And the interval from six to positive infinity. So I'm just going to list those intervals out. And then I'm going to list out these on the in a column here. x minus six and x minus three. And I'm running out of space, so I'm going to have to rewrite something here.
Now I'm also going to list just the word product here, or prod or product, uh, and this is now going to be just a big table. And uh, we're looking for we're looking for positive products here. So this table is going to help us organize the sign of each factor, and then we'll take the products to find right the product here. So in each of these boxes, what you're going to do is you're going to put a plus or a minus sign depending on some test number that you pick. So in this first interval, negative infinity to negative 3, I'm going to pick any number in there. So I don't know, negative 4 is a good candidate. That's our test number here. It's in this interval. And now we're going to put a plus or a minus sign here and here, depending on the sign of these things when I plug in negative 4. So if I plug in negative 4 here, I get negative 10. It's definitely negative. I don't care that it's a negative 10. I just care that it's negative. Okay. Now, I picked negative 4, but it wouldn't matter which one I picked. I could pick any number in here, and it'll still give me a negative result. Because a negative number, minus 6, is still negative. So you don't have to worry about which number you pick in the interval. Just make sure you pick a number in that interval. <laughs> How about this one? Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. It's negative. So the product of these two things, x minus 6 times x plus 3, in this interval, if we pick any number in this interval, we're going to get a negative number times a negative number, which gives us a positive overall result, which is great. We've just found a set of numbers that satisfies this inequality, which is the same as the one we were asked to solve. So in this process, all we're doing is we're, we're finding these sets of numbers which solve the original inequality. Is this clear, clear so far? So how about here? What is the sign of x minus 6 for any number in this interval, negative 3 to 6? I would pick a number, do a test, and just write down the sign. Plus or minus? Go ahead. Someone tell me. Minus. Why is that? Well, I chose 5, and then when you plug it in, it's 5 minus 6, which is negative 1. Perfect. You picked a test number, and it, it turned out to be negative. Great. If you, if you think about the product, or sorry, the, the factor here, you're going to subtract 6. The biggest number you could choose is 6, but you can't actually pick it. So if you subtract 6 from any number less than 6, you're going to get a negative. OK, good. How about this one? Positive or negative? Jay says positive. He's right. And it's the same reason. We picked the same number, 5. 5 plus 3 is 8. That's, that's clearly a positive number. The product then is a negative. Right? We're going to take this times this. And if we pick a number in here, we're going to have a negative product overall, which means it's not satisfying this. We're looking for positive things. So this is not part of our solution. 6 to infinity. I'll speed this up. We're plugging in a number bigger than 6. So when we subtract 6, we get a positive left over. We're plugging in a positive number in this interval. When you take a positive plus a positive, you have a positive result. Positive times positive is positive. 
So we've got another part of our solution. So now the question is, what about the endpoints 3 and 6? And there you need to look right here. If this is an equals, if there is an equals underneath it, you include the endpoints. If it is not, like this problem, if it's strict, don't include the endpoints. When you plug in negative 3, you get 0 here. And the whole product is 0. And 0 is not greater than 0. If you plug in 6, this factor becomes 0. And the whole product becomes 0. And 0 is not bigger than 0. So if this is strict, don't include the endpoints. If it is not strict, include the endpoints. Our solution is in interval notation negative infinity to negative 3 with 6 to infinity. So that's a union of those two sets. It's the set of all numbers less than negative 3 or, or bigger than 6. Questions about this? We're going to go ahead and move on to section 1.9. Um, there were more problem types in that section with absolute values and things like that, but it all just boils down to solving inequalities, either linear or nonlinear, and you've just seen how to do those things. So um, I think you've got all the skills you need to solve all of them. You just need to apply the tools that you saw. If you have other questions on that section, just let me know uh, through email or something else. Come to office hours, and then I can help you out there. Okay. So in section 1.9, we were working on the coordinate plane, and we were uh, working with um, the graphs of things. So first, let me just give a pulse check here. Several, several of you have been answering, and that's great. But I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. So I'll give you uh, just maybe three minutes to answer this one. It's not too difficult. How many of these points are in quadrant three? Again, you don't have to get this right. I'm not grading you on whether or not <laughs> you got it right. Out of curiosity, while the rest of us finish this up, um, are you able to change your answer once you've selected it? No. Okay, so you click it, and then it, it's like, it's just done. <laughs> okay. None of my professors in any of my classes have ever given me a poll, so I have no, I, I don't know. I have no experience with this from the user end. Thank you for your answers. Yep. We have quite a lot of variety here, which is interesting. Okay. Yeah, thank you for those who responded. So there's still a few of you that have not responded yet. If you just don't know, go ahead and throw an answer in. I don't care which answer. I'm not, you're not being graded, but just go ahead and throw your answer in, any old answer. OK. 
okay, so I'll just assume that they're not here. So here we go. Can you see now the pole? I think you should be able to see it. So there's quite a lot of variety here, which is, is interesting. That's good. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and use this as an opportunity to talk about these things. So uh, in the coordinate plane, we have two axes, two real number lines. One of them we usually label the X axis, and one of them we label the Y axis. So we call these axes, which is spelled exactly like axes, but spelled but pronounced axes. <laughs> and uh, individually, you just replace the E with the I, right? So axis. Um, Usually we call them these because these are the standard variable names, right? X and Y are the first two variables. The third variable is always a Z, you know, usually. I, I should I should say 60% of the time it's it's always Z. Um, and then you get it, start getting into other things, but X and Y is your typical two variables to start with. So we see if you put two lines here that the whole surface is broken into four parts, right? four quadrants. This one here we call quadrant one. This one here in a counterclockwise manner is two. This one is three. And this one is four. Okay, so one, two, three, four. And I think this might be causing some of the variety that I'm seeing because oftentimes people number them in the other order or they, they, they think maybe one is over here or here or here. Um, if you're a computer scientist, this is quadrant one, uh, <laughs> because if you're working with graphical user interfaces, here's zero, zero, here's the positive X, and here's the positive Y. So everything's sort of flipped, um, but that's, that's okay. So we're looking for points from that list that are in quadrant three. So let's plot some. How far do I go at? Seven. Uh, five. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Negative one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And negative one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so every tick mark represents one unit of length. So one, two, our first point, one, two, has an x coordinate of one and a y coordinate of two. So we plot it there. We go over one, up two. This is one, comma, two. So that's not, so not that one. Negative three, four, so negative one, two, three, and up four. One, two, three, four. So this is negative three, comma, four. We just went left three and up four. The next one, oh, well, obviously that one's not in quadrant three either. The next one's zero, so we don't go left or right at all, comma, five, so up there. Just straight up five. That's not down here. And uh, negative one, zero. I have a question. Yeah. So that zero, five, would that be considered like not in any quadrant? Right. It's on the line? You could, you could say it that way. You could say it's not technically in a quadrant. Um, the more, probably the more uh, uh, proper thing to say is it's on the boundary of two quadrants. Oh, OK. Um, but I won't hold it against you if you say that it's in quadrant two or one, because <laughs> you know it kind of is. It, it depends. Do we, when we say quadrant one, do we mean, you know, everything here, including these edges, or do we not include the edges? I, you can argue it both ways, really. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the question in the chat was, does this count as being in quadrant three? This is probably the other reason there's so much variation in the answers. Some of you said no. Some of you said yes. And uh, you can argue it both ways. Properly, I would say it's on the boundary. It's not in the interior. So by that, it's not in quadrant three. But it is on the boundary. So if we're including the boundary, it definitely is. Um, so we'll, I will count it. So there's one. Boom, we got one. Uh, the next one, negative one, negative two, right here, squarely in, squarely in quadrant three. Uh, and one half and 0.7. So one half 
and 0 0.7, it's right here. So, for those of you that said 3, it could have been you were looking at a different quadrant, I'm not sure. Um, for those of you that said 2, right on. For those of you that said 1, right on. Okay, great job. Um, none of them are in quadrant 4. Okay, so I, for those of you that said none of them are in Q3, um, quadrant 3 is right here. And so we're counting this point, we're counting that point perhaps. I hope, I hope that answers a bunch of questions. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop sharing results. Yeah, for years, a long time ago, I built 3D printers and designed a lot of things on them. And, and 3D printers, their, their entire function is to be plotting machines, right? To just play, just to lay plastic or metal or chocolate or something in a plot. And so it's just, if you, if you really get into the guts of a 3D printer, it's just a bunch of motors that precisely move some extruder along some path and so all of that plotting that you just saw in 3d printers and and you're looking at a screen now which is just a big plot you know, like all of what we just did here is exactly what you're seeing on your screens and exactly what a 3d printer does you know it's the primary function of these of these devices is just plotting <laughs> So it's a very important thing uh, to understand this. So if you don't, if you don't understand this still, uh, go ahead and shoot me a message, and, and I'll try and sort that out during office hours or or some other way. Um, let's get into a couple other problems here. Um, I'm going to sketch a region now. So this is question 15, and it says sketch the region. I did not talk about this on the video, uh, but here we go. So it's the set of all coordinates x, y such that x is bigger than or equal to 2. So this is a region. A region is like an area. right? We are in the uh, central New York region. So you know the whole state looks, I don't know, New York looks something like this. And uh, we're in this region here, like central New York or uh, upstate New York. It's this area. So when you're asked to sketch a region, you're graphing, you're plotting an area. So here we go. I'm just going to pick a random point here. So one, two, three, four, five. Everything is just going to be units here. not exactly perfect. I'm not trying to be super precise, um, but every one of these tick marks is a unit, so one. So I'm just going to pick a random point here. Three, two. And I'm just going to ask myself, is this in the region that we're looking at? The set of all coordinates where x is bigger than or equal to two. Is this in there? Yeah, definitely is. We're looking at the x coordinate. It's 3. 3 is bigger than 2. So this one checks out. How about this one? 2, 2. Yes? Yeah. I look at the x coordinate. It's 2. And we want to we want to include all the points that have a coordinate, an x coordinate bigger than or equal to two. So that one checks out. How about this one? One two. Definitely not. We look at the x coordinate because that's what we're looking at here. The set of all points with an x coordinate bigger than 2, that's 1. 
So it's not bigger than two. So no, not this one. So I, I kind of was looking left and right, and I, I found sort of a, a boundary here. And if I just did this sort of a thing, I'm going to erase these points. If I draw this line, this is the line, the vertical line of x equals 2. I'll make it solid. Our is any point on this line in our region? The answer is yes. Because no matter what point I pick here, the x coordinate is always going to be 2. Because that's how, that's how this line is defined. It doesn't matter what the y coordinate is for this set. We just care about the x being 2 or bigger. Which side? We just checked that. Which side has the points with the x-coordinate bigger than 2? It's this side, the right side. Here's 2. Here's all the numbers of x that are bigger. So I'm just going to go ahead and shade this side. Any point that you pick over here will be in this set. Because any point over here is an x, y pair where the x-coordinate is clearly bigger than 2. Okay. Um, so that's that. That's just something that we didn't actually do before. There are some really hard ones in this, in this section of sketching the region. So I'll... I'll put... Uh, Maybe I'll just put an easier one. This is 19A. This one starts to get at some difficult ideas, but not, not too much. Um, so it's the set of all coordinates such that negative 2 is less than x is less than 2. And... y is greater than or equal to negative 1. The harder ones that I was talking about would be like question 20 where they're looking at the set of all x, y's that have like an absolute value greater than 1 or, uh, or x times y is greater than 0, things like that. So they, they do get more difficult. This one sort of borders on that, but it's still not too bad. Okay, so just like before, um, we're looking for all those coordinates where the x-coordinate is between negative 2 and 2. So let's focus on the x-axis. Here's 2, here's negative 2. So this inequality here says that our x coordinate needs to be between those two. So we can we can go above or below them. But this says we just need to be somewhere in between negative 2 and 2. So I'm going to draw as best I can dotted lines here. And I'm going to shade in between here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat both of these inequalities separately for just a minute. I'm going to graph all of these coordinates that work. So that's, that's here. If I pick any point in here, the x-coordinate is definitely between negative 2 and 2. And now I'm going to graph those. So the y-coordinate is bigger than or equal to negative 1. So here's negative 1. So I'm going to, in solid blue here, draw that line. Any point on this line has a y-coordinate of negative 1. So any point above this line has a y-coordinate bigger than negative 1. So I'm going to shade now 
everything up here and everything up here. So the blue shaded area satisfies this. The red shaded area satisfies this. So which area satisfies both? It's this region here. It's the region that is satisfying, right, both those things. And with our shadings, it's the region that is shaded both colors. So I'm just going to erase the things that we don't need here. It's sort of this rectangle that is like that and going up forever. So you pick any point in here. The x coordinate will be between negative 2 and 2, and the y coordinate will be bigger than negative 1. Pick any point in this little rectangle as, as high up as you want, it'll satisfy that set. Okay. Questions on sketching regions? Okay. So there were a few uh, formulas that you had in this in this section as well. Um, things like midpoint formula and the distance formulas. So the first one, I'll just ask you for, I'll give you two points, and I want to ask you what the distance between them is and what the midpoint is between them. So 25, find the midpoint and the distance D between 0, 8, and 616. So I'm not going to plot them because it's not super helpful. Um, you could plot them if you wanted, um, but after you plot them, you're going to just you're going to have that picture, but you're still going to have to go to the formulas that you looked at in the lecture. So I'll start with the distance formula. The distance formula says between any two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2, I'm writing these below those points so that these are my x1, y1, and this is my x2 and y2. The distance between these two points is equal to x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared, square rooted. That's the distance between any two points. This comes right out of the Pythagorean theorem. And uh, I explained that in the lecture video. So we'll go ahead and we'll just apply this. X1 is 0. X2 is 6. Y1 is 8. Y2 is 16. So this is the square root of 36 plus 64. 36 and 64 makes 100. So the distance is exactly 10. 10 units. More or less in the graph, we've got two points. We're looking for this distance between them. That forms a hypotenuse of a right triangle where this is the length of this line segment, this is the length of this line segment, and the Pythagorean theorem says that the length of this hypotenuse, a squared, right? if we square that length, it's equal to the square of the other ones added together. So you square root both sides and you've got your distance formula. So the distance is 10.
Now the midpoint, very similar to this formula, very similar with one difference. Instead of subtracting coordinates and squaring them, we're actually just going to add things and average them. So distance, all right here, was 10. The midpoint is a coordinate. It's a point. So it has an x and a y coordinate. So, and here's how you find them. It's you add the x's together and you average them. You add the y's together to average them. So here we go. x plus x is 6. Divide by 2. y plus y is 24. Divide by 2. So the midpoint is 3, 12. Okay, and you can sort of confirm things here. 12 is exactly halfway. It's 4 above 8 and 4 below 16. 3 is 3 above 0 and 3 below 6. That's always going to happen when you're finding midpoints. This x is going to be exactly halfway between these two, and this y is going to be exactly halfway between these two. So that's a nice way to kind of check your midpoint result. Questions on that? Okay. Um, in this section, we did learn how to graph for the first time. Um, and I gave some examples in the lecture on Monday. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna forego giving more examples here. Um, because there are examples on Monday's lecture and we're gonna be learning to graph things all semester. The basic idea is just that if you're given some rule, so y equals a rule with x in it. So the rule could be like, take x, multiply it by three and add seven, or square x and then add two. The basic idea is you, you plug in some x's and then you get out the y coordinates. So you, if our rule was 3x plus 1, you're just going to pick some x's, and you're just going to figure out what you get from the rule. And this gives you a pair. You plugged in 0, you got 1. You plug in 3. get 10. The basic idea from this section for graphing is that you're just going to be making a table and you're going to be finding these pairs of numbers where you plug in the x to find the y, then you plot these things 0, 1, 3, 3, 10, and then you connect them as smoothly as possible. Okay, if you wanna be more precise with your graph, you plot more points. Instead of just two, do seven or eight or nine. <laughs> this is how a computer does it, right? It, it takes your rule and then it computes, depending on the resolution of your graph, it computes thousands or millions of points and then it plots them on your screen. Okay, um, so the next section uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get to is lines. And uh, we'll go ahead and look at a few, sorry my camera's out of focus over here, okay we got it. Um, we'll just look at uh, some things here from 1.10 on the lines. We've got about 13 minutes left. 
No one's throwing questions into the chat, so I'm hoping you don't have any questions. Um, so I'm going to draw three lines here. Line one. Line two. And line three. Okay, my question is, which line has uh, first defined slope? It has a slope. Maybe there's multiple lines. Which line has a defined slope? Question mark. Throw it in the chat, say it out loud. Go ahead. Great, yes. I see two people responded. Lines one and two. Line three is sort of a strange line. Here's my question. If this is, let's say, negative 2, my follow-up question, what is the formula? For line 3. It doesn't have a defined slope. So what's its formula? So Yashia, you say y equals 2x. So this looks just like slope intercept form, right? This is our slope times our x. This is our y intercept. So you're saying that m is defined, the slope is defined, and in fact it's 2. And now you're changing your answer and you're saying negative 2x. Well, you're still saying it's defined and it's negative 2. But just a second ago you said it's not defined. Aha, uh -huh. yes, yes. Glad you see that. And Jacob, great answer. Yes, it's x equals negative 2. It's sort of a strange case, right? But what is line 3? It's the, it's the set of all points Line 3 is the set of all points where one thing is true. The x-coordinate is negative 2. All right, you pick any point here, any point at all. I don't know what y is, but I can guarantee you that x-coordinate is negative 2. So the formula is literally the requirement, x equals negative 2. Okay, line one has a specific sign on its slope. Line one has positive or negative slope. Line one is the red one here. Does it have positive or negative slope? Positive. Positive is correct. So positive slopes, if a line has a positive slope, it doesn't have to start in quadrant 3. It's okay. It's okay. So it doesn't have to start in quadrant 3. It could it could only show up here, right? Like like this. But if it if it's going up on its way to the right, it has a positive slope. Okay? It doesn't matter how flat it is either. If, if, if it's just barely climbing, it's still positive. It's a positive slope. Positive slope. If it is falling to the right, then it has negative slope. So line two has negative slope. 
Okay, good. Good, 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 good. I think we needed this. That was, that's good. Thank you for your answers and for willing to be wrong. That's great. Um, the other day I answered a question in one of my classes and my professor literally, literally, well, he was very gracious, but he, he had more or less was like, are you serious? <laughs> he was, he was, I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> he was just like, he literally said, I guess it's not obvious. <laughs> and then he <laughs> corrected me. But uh, thank you for being willing to be wrong. So let's talk about equations or forms of, of, of lines. So let me give you a few. And uh, we've got three lines here. These all look like lines. First, what do we call this form? The way this equation looks, what do we call this one? Slope intercept is right. How about the next one? okay if you don't know point slope is correct the last one if no one gets this one it will be completely ironic I see no answers. This one is called two things. The first one is called general form. That's what your book calls it. General form. But it's also commonly called the standard form. This is the standard form and nobody knows it. Which is always ironic to me whenever I teach this class. But standard form is like this. You've got all the variables on one side. Yes, actually, Jay, all of these are lines. These are all linear functions. These are all linear functions, no matter what. If, 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 if you see there's no, if there's just a, a one exponent on the x and the y, that means they're lines. They have to be separated, of course. Um, you can't have like this, like 2xy equals 1. This is not linear. If there's, a, if there's a plus sign between them, it becomes linear. But if there's a product, it's not linear. Um, very good. OK, so now let's just let's look at these things and analyze the forms just a little bit more. So this one's called slope-intercept. <clears throat> it's in slope-intercept form because two things are very obvious from this form. The first is that. 1 tells us that the point 0, 1 is on the graph. 0, 1. So we just write the 1 here. We put a 0 here. This point is definitely on the graph. And that's what we're calling the intercept because it's the I guess strictly it is the y intercept of the graph. If you were to graph this this line it would cross at a at that point. So it's the y intercept because that's where that line crosses the y axis. Slope because this number here is the slope. So if you know two things about a line, if you know its slope, and if you know its y-intercept, you can very, very quickly put it in slope-intercept form. So what is the formula 
for a line with slope equal to negative 4 and y intercept 0 comma negative 3. Well, we're going to go to this one and we're just going to say to ourselves, well, y equals the slope negative 4 times x plus the y-intercept, negative 3, so minus 3. And there you have it. That is the formula. So if you know these two things about a line or in a problem, if you're given these two pieces of information, this is the exact form that you should go to right away because you can just write the equation down right away. The next form was point-slope form, and it is very, very, very helpful. If you don't necessarily know the y-intercept, right? that's a specific point on the y-axis, but if you know any point, like say here, I'll give you the graph of a line, I'll say it has slope equal to 1 half, and let's say it goes through this point, 5 comma 7. Right? If I just give you any point and then give you the slope, point slope form is really nice to use because you can just fill in the blanks. Usually it's written like this, y minus y coordinate equal to slope times x minus x coordinate. So this x1, y1 is the point that the line goes through. The 4 is the slope. So if I ask you for the equation of this line, you could do this. You could put it in slope intercept, but it would take some figuring out to determine that point. The much easier thing to do is put it into this form. y minus 7 equals 1 half times x minus 5. That's the form of the line. That's the equation for it. Okay, it's just literally filling in the blanks. General slash standard form is a little more complicated, but more or less to put something in general or standard form, you put it first <laughs> into one of these two forms, and then you distribute things if you need to, and then move all the variables to one side. Okay, so it's it's a bit more of a, you know, uh, you do this or this first and then you go there. It's a bit of that. There are nice tricks to finding this quickly, um, but those take just some techniques that we don't have time to go through right now. So, what I said should suffice. Okay, so uh, I need to get a new erasing rag. This one's spent and it is 920, so that means class is over. Um, if you didn't quite have um, the questions answered that you wanted to ask, uh, well, go ahead and shoot me an email. Um, I will answer those questions right after class here. On Monday, I will upload the lectures for the next set of sections, which off the top of my head, I don't remember. And let's see, I can look real quick. It would be sections 1.11, 2.1, and 2.2. Homework for uh, these sections. Is due Monday at midnight. And this Friday, we have a quiz on sections 1.3, 1.4, and 1.5. That's this Friday. Again, it'll be open all day. You get 10 minutes to take it, but uh, you can take it at any time you want during the day. Okay? So with that, thanks for coming in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. I'll see you Monday if you or during office hours or, or Wednesday next week. So, okay? You too. Take care.